Hello, good people of the world. This is The Big Heavy, and today we're talking plastic decks. Now, before we get into the top 10 things I wish I had known and that I think you should know before you start your plastic deck project, let me ask you a few questions. Are you tired of having to paint or stain your wood deck every year and tired of it looking like this? When you're thinking about your dream deck and starting to design it, do you have dreams of exotic woods like Ipe and tiger wood and cedar, but at the end of the day, your budget's a little more southern yellow pine? Or do you just really like the sound of the word composite? Composite. So it's a beautiful day down here, and we're sitting on the deck that I put together and redid with Trex, which is a composite deck product, and a couple of reasons why I made that choice. So for me, it was partially about not having the paint or stain every year, uh, partially about the, the look of the product, but this particular deck is in, as you can see, pretty direct sun in the afternoon, and it's shaded by the building that it's attached to. It's essentially a staircase. So it's dark and cool all day. And then about noon, once the sun crosses uh, its apex, it's indirect sun and it gets hot out here. And we'll talk a little bit about heat and sun and some of these composite deck products in a few minutes. But the challenge with wood is that it's not a consistent product. What makes wood beautiful and what makes it a lot of fun to work with is that it's natural. And there's grain, there's different densities, and when you subject a material like that to continuing cycles of hot and cold and wet and ice and everything, it starts to warp because different parts of the wood will bend and flex and expand and contract at different rates. And in my case, it got to the point where you, know, you could literally see boards on the stairs in particular that would start to warp as the day went on and would curl up and just got pretty nasty looking. And it happened relatively quickly in about uh, five years after we, we built this house. And I spent a lot of time and fair amount of, uh, of money and effort redoing the upstairs room above this garage. And it looked beautiful, but you'd walk up this janky set of stairs to get up there. And you know, literally I was, I was getting to a point where I was worried about my family or anyone that came over and worried about their safety with some of the, the deck boards on these stairs that were you know, wobbly and creaky and bending and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So what really sold the, a composite deck product for me was that since it is man-made and since you, know, you can see it's essentially sawdust and uh, ground up plastic and kind of a, a mix of a variety of materials on the inside, but it's consistent. It's the same stuff all across. You know, the outside is the same consistent uh, cap, I believe they call it. So it does expand and contract and does, uh, does actually expand and contract quite a bit in the different temperatures, but it does so consistently. You know, it expands in all dimensions and then it cools down, it contracts in all dimensions. So hopefully there's less risk of warping in the long term. And this has been down for about a year now, haven't had any problems, probably a little too early to tell, but still looking good and still uh, very durable, solid, way better than the, uh, the pretty janky decking it replaced. So for me, that was a big driver in going to composite. And now let's get into the meat of things once we get through a couple of disclaimers. So disclaimer number one, I always like to tell you when I'm showing off a sponsored product or something that I got for free. In this case, everything you're gonna see, everything I'm gonna talk about, paid for with my own hard earned cash and uh, you know, research various options and ended up selecting what, uh, what was right for me. Second disclaimer, I'm not a professional. I'm a typical homeowner, uh, barely evolved from a big dumb animal. So make sure you check your local rules, make sure you apply for the proper permits, get professional advice if you need it. Don't run with scissors, always floss twice after you eat. And for God's sakes, wait 15 minutes before going in the pool after eating. With that out of the way, let's talk about the 10 things that I wish I had known when I embarked on my deck project. And some of these will be a little skewed towards DIYers, people that are gonna do this project themselves. But even if you're thinking of hiring this out, I think it's good to know some of these things. It'll make you a smarter, more educated consumer. You'll understand a little bit of the quoting behind the, the process, and you'll be able to ask your potential contractors some intelligent questions. So without any further ado, let's get to it. So tip number one, skills you need to complete this job. 
one thing I always wonder when I think about doing a job myself is, you know, do I have the tools? Do I have the skills? How hard is it going to be? How long is it going to take me? Um, my rule of estimating for how long a job's going to take me is I plan it all out, do a whole bunch of very precise calculations, multiply the time I come up with by four, and then it usually takes me twice as long as that. So can't really help you there, but I can help you with skill level. So if you've done, I think a good equivalent project would be something like interior crown molding, where you've done some miter cuts, you've had to do some precise measuring, you've had to work with wood and materials overhead, you've maybe used a pneumatic nailer and had to do a little bit of precision fitting and work and measuring and all that. That would be a project that, you know, if you had done successfully and felt pretty good about doing a, doing a deck and particularly changing out the deck boards, I think would be, a, be within your capabilities. Uh, similarly, if you framed a bathroom, built a wall, uh, you know, built a shed, any kind of general framing carpentry, that's going to be a key element of uh, building out your deck, even if you're just replacing decking. And we'll talk about why framing carpentry is going to be an important skill in a little bit. You know, outside those skills, there's a lot of lifting, there's a lot of moving, there's some overhead work, you're going to be probably climbing some ladders, depending on how high off the ground your deck is. You're generally going to probably be wanting to operate a pneumatic nailer, which has a, a set of, uh, of skills and dangers around it. You're going to be doing a lot of uh, screwing, um, depending on the, the type of product you use to hold down your deck board. So if you're comfortable with all that, if you've got the tools for all of that, then I think this is a, a project that's imminently doable by the, by the average homeowner. So tip number two, get yourself some samples. Now, a lot of people, if you're like me and you're a typical homeowner, you start off with a big box store. You, know, you go down there, you see what they have. Uh, maybe they have a couple or three different varieties of composite decking, and maybe they have a couple or three ratty samples sitting around. What I would highly recommend, just skip the big box store and go right to the manufacturers. Uh, two of the big ones, I've got two of their samples here. Um, this is a piece of Trex. It is, doesn't tell me what the actual product is, but you can see they have their nice little sticker on the back that uh, tells you a little bit about the product. Uh, this is a piece of Timber Tech. Um, you know, similar sticker on the back. You can get a good look at the product and a few different reasons to get samples. You know, the obvious one is check out the color, see if you like it. Uh, I'm not sure how well the camera will render these, but you can see the textures are, are kind of different on these guys. You know, the, uh, the Trex almost is a little shinier, uh, a little more grain pattern. The uh, Timber Tech, uh, a little less on the grain, um, maybe a little bit more of a natural finish, kind of depending on on what you like there. Obviously these are, are two different colors, but the samples are super cheap. I think it's uh, 10 bucks or so to get up to five. Um, you know, I think one of the companies, they were, uh, they were free, but you know, get four or five, get stuff from different manufacturers. The weights of these two materials are very different. Um, you can kind of see the, the structure is a little bit different. The Trex has more of a defined uh, plastic cap around it. The Timber Tech, a little more consistent. Um, you know, one thing we'll talk about a little bit, the edge, you know, in this particular color, very similar to the actual cap and grain pattern. Uh, you know, this guy, not so much. It's a little bit more tan, uh, a little bit more brown on the top. The product I ultimately used, and we'll talk about why this is important, the, uh, the end grain was, uh, was very different than the actual cap. And that caused us to have to do a little bit of creative work on the framing. Other big reasons to get yourself some samples, aside from seeing how they look, you know, think about how you're going to use your deck. If you're going to be out there and you know you like to get together with a few friends, have some wine, maybe people get uh, get a little bit careless sometimes. Take some samples, spill some red wine on them. You know, leave them out for three, four days. See how it cleans up. See if it stains. Uh, similarly, if you have a big dog or a, a large pet, you know, go out and see if you can get them to uh, scratch on these a little bit, or you know, take some nails and do some scratching and see uh, see if it's it gets damaged. Other big thing, a lot of people uh, ask about, does this stuff get hot in the sun? And you know, if you Google around, some people say absolutely, other people say absolutely not. Manufacturers will kind of uh, beat around the bush a little bit on that question. And for me, at least for the product I used, it gets hot. And this is probably the worst case scenario for a, uh, any kind of decking product in that it's right in direct sun. You know, we're in the Southern, southern United States, so Typical day in the summer might be 80, 90, you know, sometimes high 90s, and you throw direct sun at that. And this stuff is just, it gets hot. It gets hot to the point that I would try and pick up a piece that I was working on, and I, you know, couldn't hold it for more than 15, 20 seconds without putting on some gloves. And for me, 
that's okay because these are stairs. You know, generally people aren't walking up and down here barefoot and you're not uh, sitting and having a nice chat with a video camera like I am now generally. Uh, so that was okay. You know, the look outweighed the fact that this stuff got really hot in the sun. But if you've got a deck around a pool where people are going to be barefoot all the time, you're going to want to know if that gets hot. And the color, the product, the texture, all those things can affect how hot the product gets. So when you get your samples, you know, again, get three or four of them, put them out in the sun, see if those suckers really heat up, you know, leave it out for a day and then put your bare feet on and see, uh, see if that's going to create a problem for you. Much better to find that out when you spent, you know, 10 bucks for a couple or three different pieces of, uh, of wood than after you've laid down all the decking and on your first sunny day, you got uh, people frying eggs out on your, out on your brand new deck. Next tip, get the installation manual for whatever product you end up using. All the manufacturers have this online. It's usually a big PDF file you can download, and that's going to have everything from specifications on how you need to adjust your framing potentially to put this in, how to cut it, how to handle it, how to store it, kind of all the tips you need. And, you know, read through that installation manual and it'll do a few things for you. Number one, it'll give you a sense of this is a project that you actually want to take on or if there's maybe some element that's that's a bit more complex than you thought. Uh, number two, usually it'll show you the different products that the manufacturer has. Uh, the decking generally comes in a variety of boards from fascia that you kind of put on the outside to cover up some of the existing lumber uh, to different railing products. So you can get an idea of what's out there. Uh, it'll usually talk to the different fastener systems and some of those you can interchange, but it'll at least give you a good idea of, of what you're signing up for when you embark on a project like this. Definitely worth, uh, worth downloading that install manual, have a printed copy kind of sitting and, and being at the ready for you. So next tip, think about your railing before you actually start your installation. And basically there's three options generally with, uh, with railing for composite decks and you know, arguably for decks in general. First, you can keep your existing railing in place. Use your old standard pressure treated post and then you know, most home stores will have a pre-made rail that goes in between those posts that's uh, made of pressure treated lumber. You can stain it to match the decking, do whatever you want. Looks okay, holds up. Eh, not so great. And you know, frankly, if you're going to invest the time, money, and labor into putting in composite, I would probably steer away from just leaving your existing pressure treated rail in. The other option is a lot of these have a sleeve system where you keep your pressure treated post, you put a plastic sleeve around it. Uh, you can do contrasting colors. They have some color match stuff. There's some different options. Uh, you can put different types of rail between it. You could use aluminum rail like this between your uh, your sleeved posts. Um, they have a PVC product generally that'll match the, the sleeve. Um, you, know, you can do all kinds of things there. The other option, which is what I chose, and you know, I guess we could call this category sort of unconventional railing, is uh, to use aluminum posts. So this is a separate post. It's uh, lagged down to the deck. You know, there's some uh, standards that you'll see in the installation manual for whatever product you choose on how to uh, fix it to the framing. You definitely don't want to just bolt this uh, this sucker into your deck board because that'll rip out if uh, a stiff breeze gets after it. And you know, aside from looking nice, the obvious purpose of railing is to keep people safe. Um, so this is an aluminum post. There's a nice little cap on it. You can put lights in here and do all sorts of stuff. There's aluminum railing that goes with it. Uh, this particular product is from Trex. Looks real nice. Uh, seems to have held up pretty well. It's durable. I will tell you that the uh, instruction and installation manual for these absolutely stinks. Um, you know, you're gonna have to read it 58 times and you're still gonna make some mistakes. Uh, there's minor subtle differences between all the parts, both the top of the rail, the bottom, the little brackets that, uh, that hold the rail in and it's very easy to confuse them, mix them up, um, particularly on these uh, um, stair sections where you have to kind of plan your cuts and these are all different lengths. and. Very easy to make mistakes, so probably plan for purchasing uh, one or two extra rail kits because if you're like me, you're going to screw at least one of them up in this series of eight or so um, sections of rail. Another tip that I ne didn't necessarily think of when I thought about installing Trex was you're going to get to play a little game as you design and build your deck called Hide the Edges. Now with wood, it's the same material through and through generally. So, you know, you cut a piece of traditional lumber, you got edge grain, you know, maybe it doesn't absorb stain or paint as well, but it's generally the same consistency, same color, same appearance, works the same, etc., as the rest of the piece of, uh, of material. With Trex and most of the other composite decking products, you've got a cap 
and maybe you can see there's a very thin layer on there that's not quite getting into focus. Very thin layer of plastic around the core. And then the core is this kind of, uh, yeah, this is where the composite comes in. Composite's basically a fancy word in this case for a bunch of sawdust, scrap plastic, glue. Um, you know, maybe there's some ground up uh, bits of Jimmy Hoffa. Whatever's in there, um, you know, it's not the same color as the, the cap on the outside. So if you installed this just in a traditional manner and kind of ran your deck boards the length of your deck, you're going to have these funky edges hanging out there. Um, you know, similarly, if you install these as stair treads, you're going to have them overhanging your uh, stair risers, which if you're not familiar are the, you know, the pieces of lumber that support the stairs. And furthermore, you're going to have all your framing, which is probably either steel bar if you're a high roller or if you're like most of us, traditional pressure treated lumber. And that's going to be a different color than your deck boards. So half of the, uh, the planning and time and everything that I put into this project was hiding these funky edges, hiding the pressure treated framing and making sure I got a nice consistent look and got the look that I wanted and a few different techniques that you can use to do that. The first is anywhere that's flat, you can picture frame. So you essentially install your decking, leave a little gap around the outside and run a piece of deck board that doesn't have these grooves around the outside. So you see the nice finished edge of the piece of, uh, of composite lumber, uh, you miter it at the end so there's a nice corner on there and you don't see the ugly uh, cut end of the product. Similarly, they make fascia boards. You uh, can kind of see one here. Um, it's got the, uh, you know, the funky look on the inside, but you don't really see that when you're walking up and it makes it look like it's the same material as the decking where you would normally see pressure treated lumber for things like the, uh, the stair stringers. So, you know, you're going to have to put a little extra thought into that. You might have to do a little extra work. In my opinion, it's worthwhile. It really makes the deck look uh, look nice, makes it pop, also has the added benefit of covering up some more surfaces that you'd otherwise have to paint or stain to match your decking. So worth the time and effort in my professional opinion. And it's really not a professional opinion, but hey, some guy on the internet says to hide your ugly edges, so get after it. So next tip, I talked about how you should avoid the big box store to go and get your samples. I would also suggest avoiding the big box store for ordering the product that you decide to go with. And there's a few reasons for that. First of all, when I looked at ordering uh, some of the Trek Select product that I ultimately ended up using from uh, Home Depot, they had a pretty long lead time. I think it was three or four weeks when I looked. And they also didn't have access to all the different colors. They didn't necessarily have all the different uh, products in stock, whether it was a fastener or some of the railing and things like that. So you know, I would have had to shop multiple, uh, multiple vendors anyway. And that kind of leads to this tip, which is find yourself a local professional builder supply. And you can look them up on Google or in you know whatever the modern equivalent that you use of the phone book is. Uh, look under builder supply, look under lumber yard. Um, but what's nice is several things. You know, first of all, they can get access to all the different products. You know, most of them have a Trex or a Zek distributor that has access to everything. They can get you all the fasteners. Uh, they can generally get it fast. You know, in most cases, I was able to get Trex stuff in a couple or three days. Uh, they deliver it right to your house. Uh, my lumberyard did all free delivery. Their prices were generally the same, if not a little bit cheaper than Home Depot or Lowe's. And the stuff would just kind of show up in your driveway, which was pretty cool. The other thing that's nice is they're used to dealing with professionals. So people that do this for a living. So they have more information, they have more knowledge, they have more skill, they have access to manufacturers and manufacturer info that you wouldn't necessarily find at a Home Depot or Lowe's. So for me, you know, I said, hey, I'm thinking of, you know, putting on aluminum railing. They gave me three or four different products that I could use. They ultimately helped me plan out all the materials that I needed. Uh, you know, I sent them measurements and kind of a picture of my, uh, my stairs and they figured out what, uh, what posts I needed, how many different rails, what size, all that stuff. So they'll help you with your planning, you know, they'll get the stuff there quicker. They're generally a little bit cheaper, um, you know, higher level of knowledge. There's really no downsides uh, in terms of ordering your decking um, and most of your framing lumber. The only downside I found is that you don't actually get to pick out the individual pieces of a product that you want. Uh, for the most part with something like Trex, everything I got was good. You know, a couple pieces had a little minor scuff on it. 
but for something like stair stringers, which are big long pieces of two by 12 pressure treated, you know, they sent me some stuff that was pretty janky. You know, it was warped, it was scuffed up. One of them had a big uh, chunk missing that looked like a dinosaur taking a little bite out of it. And something as important as a stair stringer that's structural, that's kind of holding up your stairs. You know, I didn't want to have that be a, be a piece of warped, uh, funky lumber that I had to deal with. Now, the nice thing about my building supply was they take back anything that wasn't special ordered. So treks they wouldn't take back, but they took back the janky stair stringers they gave me. And I just rolled down to my local big box and found some stuff that was nice, that was a little less warped and in a little better shape and drove home with uh, gigantic pieces of pressure treated hanging out the back of a minivan. But that's how I roll. Next tip, let's talk tools. So usually the other question I get right after, you know, what skills do I need to actually execute this project is what tools do I need? Uh, for this type of project, you know, like anyone, um, you know, I would say the first rule of DIY is that any theoretical cost savings can and should be applied directly to tools. Uh, when your um, partner asks you, you know, did we actually save any money on that project? The answer is always absolutely. And I used all those savings to acquire new tools so that I could do more projects for you in the future. Um, in this case, tool needs can go basic to, you know, there's some funky, uh, more specialized tools. But what I would recommend uh, if I had to kind of do a shopping list, and this is how I would prioritize it is number one, solid miter saw. Uh, if you don't have a miter saw, that's probably a, a great tool to have. You know, they're, they're essentially good for cutting long pieces of wood lengthwise, use them for crown molding, use them for decking, use them for just cutting general framing lumber, uh, all sorts of, of wonderful things you can do with it. And probably the close second, once you get that miter saw, and I delayed buying one of these for several years, which was frankly stupid, is a miter saw stand. A stand does a few things for you. Uh, most of them, or you know, at least the, the ones I'd recommend have wheels. So you can kind of fold them up, roll them like a little cart into your garage. You can get your miter saw in and out. You know, I can go from having to drag it out on a workbench and you know, goof around with leveling anything I was trying to cut to being set up and ready to cut in you know, a couple or three minutes, which is, uh, is huge, especially if you're you know, someone that has a family, typical homeowner that's trying to do a hundred different things and you know, maybe you have to take up, set down a couple or three times during a day, that stand's gonna make a huge difference. It's going to help support some of the uh, the things you're cutting. Uh, with a project like this, you're cutting long boards. This Trek stuff is heavy, so having that extra support is fantastic. Next thing I'd recommend, you know, you might be thinking it's a circular saw. I didn't use my circular saw for this project as much as I thought I would. And part of that is because I frankly suck with a circular saw. I've seen people that are artists that can freehand ripping a piece of uh, four by plywood, do a perfect straight cut at 90 degrees. You, know, you could give me a guy, you could give me lasers, you could give me uh, the steadiest hand in America, and I would still be off five or six inches at the other side of the sheet of plywood. So you know, for me, a circular saw didn't make a ton of sense. I do have a great one. I've used it for other projects, but I'm just not that accurate with it. I've seen pros that could build an entire deck with just a circular saw. They don't need a miter saw. All their cuts are square, even the miters, and they're fantastic. For me, I'd rather have a miter saw. I'd rather have to walk down from where I'm working over to the miter saw so I can get accurate quality cuts. But for you, that might be different. You may be a circular saw artist and you know, I'd probably go cordless. If you're on a deck, you might be up above the ground. You, know, you might be uh, working in a little bit of an awkward position and having that cordless ability is, uh, is quite beneficial. So assuming you got yourself some good saws, other key thing that I would recommend that you probably shouldn't skimp on. I'd, I'd probably actually recommend this over the miter saw. I'd rather see you saw by hand than skimp on knee pads. Now, you may be saying, okay, old guy, of course you're gonna tell me to get knee pads. I'm 18, I'm a young buck, my knees are great. But let me tell you, they're not gonna be great forever. And you spend one day working on your knees without knee pads, you're gonna be limping around like you're 85 years old the next day. Good pair of knee pads is like 40 bucks. It's not a ton of money. Don't get those stupid, you know, $5 ones at Harbor Freight that's just a piece of foam with, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, elastic on the back that kind of runs over your pet, your knees. Get yourself something good. I like the ones that have kind of the hard cap on the outside. I've used them for tiling floors. I've used them to do all the decking here where you're on your knees, you know, putting uh, deck boards in regardless of what kind of fastener you're using. And, you know, they've just, They've saved my knees. They're absolutely fantastic. And even if you're doing cabinetry in the house or something, just having those knee pads is gonna 
really you know, not only save your knees, but make life a lot more pleasant. So get some good knee pads for the love of God. Thinking about a little more specialized tools. Um, you know, these are things that make the job a little nicer. Don't necessarily have to have them. Uh, one would probably be a jigsaw. I have a nice cordless jigsaw. They're great for any kind of detailed cuts you need to do, anything where you need to get into a corner, uh, maybe notch some of your deck boards to get around a piece of trim. They're great for that. Um, you know, what I like with a cordless one is you can be up on the deck, you can do your notching, do a test fit, take a little more off and not have to worry about running over. Um, that's a pretty nice tool. I think I'd recommend torpedo level, uh, you know, long bubble level, typical uh, set of carpentry tools, good tape measure, lots of pencils. Um, you know, I like to have a tool belt. Some people don't like them, but you know, there's definitely applications, particularly when I was putting up the, uh, the new stair stringers here where you're hanging on a ladder, you're dealing with something overhead, you're drilling, you're screwing, uh, you're pulling stuff out and having that all strapped to your body made a world of difference. In terms of other more esoteric tools, I mean, if you're a technology person, there's some, uh, some technology you can take advantage of here. I've got a drone. I'm constantly looking for ways to use it so I can convince my wife I didn't just buy it as a toy. And with this deck project, it was actually quite useful. I was able to fly it up over the deck, take some pictures of the old decking, draw out how I was going to add new framing and do a bit of planning on how I was going to structure this deck. Um, Another uh, technology tool that was kind of fun for this project, I have a, a portable Sonos speaker. There's a whole variety of wireless speakers uh, that have Alexa or whatever your favorite assistant built in is. And I had that out sitting here with me. I could pick music I wanted to listen to. I could ask it to add up, you know, complex fractions, uh, do some funky long division if I needed to, but kind of a neat, uh, neat tool to have with you. Final tip, and this probably applies to anything in life, uh, including this video I'm trying to make where I've got wind blowing, I've got my dog walking up here and plopping his rather large derriere next to the camera tripod and shaking it. I've got some school doing PA announcements. Um, you know, plan for the unexpected. It's gonna happen, especially a project like this where maybe you're taking up some old decking and replacing it with a composite product. You're gonna find things you didn't expect. In my case, I knew I was gonna have to add some stringers. Uh, I downloaded the Trax installation manual as previously recommended, hint, hint, and knew I was going to need uh, five stringers for each stair based on the width of my stairs. And I had three in there and I thought, hey, I'll just add two, it's gonna be fantastic. Started ripping up the old decking. And as I mentioned in the beginning, it was a little warped, it was a little nasty. And that warping had messed up the stringers, literally to the point where, you know, I could pretty gently poke the, uh, the tread part on one of the stringers and it would just rip off. The wood had basically disintegrated. Uh, it was all warped, it was all jacked up. There was no way I was going to be able to reuse it. So I found myself in the situation having never built a set of stairs and assuming that I could just trace the existing ones and live happily ever after with needing to build a new set of stairs. And not only that, but two sets, fairly long sets of stringers and needing to build five of them for each set. So didn't do the greatest job, had to do a little bit of shimming action on that other staircase. No one would ever know except for me now that everything's all trimmed up and, and looking good, but not something I planned for, not a skill I thought I would need to deploy, but uh, one I had to learn and had to make do. You know, you'll find some piece of framing needs a little bit of, uh, of help. Uh, you know, I found the flashing up by that door up there that you can see in the back of the shot wasn't quite done correctly, so had to goof around with that after I had ripped off all the decking and ripped off these stairs and had no way to get up to that room. So just be prepared for the unexpected. And when it happens, take a pause, think through your options. Um, you know, one thing I've worked on quite a bit is if it's the end of the day, if you're getting a little bit, of frust little bit frustrated and you're like, hey, let me just spend 20 more minutes, I'll bring out the BFH and just whack the shit out of this thing and maybe that'll get the job done. Maybe call it a day instead, sleep on it, approach it with fresh eyes, ask the internet for help and get after it. So in any case, hope you found all these tips helpful. Hope that if you do decide to embark on a composite deck project, that all goes well for you. You know, I think it's been a, a rewarding project. Level of difficulty was about what I expected. Uh, it took a little longer than expected based on having to learn stairs and some of those other things I mentioned, but looks good. Hopefully this stuff will last. Haven't had to paint or stain it. Again, it's only been a year but it looks infinitely better than uh, pressure treated lumber I've seen in, in this type of environment after a year. 
and hopefully you will have the same experience. Wish you well and keep on building.